It sounds like we should really put the most important bit at the really, really start of the first video. Welcome to a walkthrough of the progress measures for grokking via mechanistic interpretability, which is this fun paper that I and Lawrence, who is here to join me, were involved in, where we took models that grokked things and then stared really hard inside of them and left with some vague understanding of what the hell is going on. And the goal of this is going to be to chat through what we did, what on earth is going on, and what is interesting about this, and why you might care. Lawrence gets a great deal of credit for being the only reason we actually wrote this paper up properly. The other co-authors were Tom Liebram, who is now DeepMind, uh, Jess Smith, and Jacob Steinhardt. This also was recently accepted as a spotlit paper at iClear, which brings my heart great joy. So, what on earth actually is grokking? What is this paper about? Grokking is this wild thing that was found in this OpenAI paper, something like a year ago or a year and a half ago, where you train small models, in their case two-layer transformers, on these toy algorithmic tasks like modular addition, modular division, composition and a permutation group, some like random toy mathematical tasks. You give it something like a third of the data, you keep training on that same third of the data for a really long time. And early on, the model just memorizes the data. You can see here it gets perfect accuracy very early on on the training data. Um, this graph is for modular addition on 30% of the data for training. And if you keep training it for a really long time, the model eventually grunks, where it suddenly-ish goes from no idea what it's doing to completely perfect on everything. The pale lines in this graph are five different random seeds for the model we trained, and it is just kind of wild that this happens. The model just sees the same data again and again. Nothing changes, but if you keep training it for a really long time, it figures things out. Like what? And the purpose of this paper was figuring out what the hell is going on. There's two things I would like to clarify about grokking. Uh, the first is grokking is not exactly the same as double descent, though it is often similar. Generally speaking, when people talk about double descent, there's a similar phenomena where models, you know, start out not generalizing, do a bit worse, like in terms of trading loss, and then the trading loss goes down or the test loss goes down as well as the models generalize later. In most cases, double descent behaves as a function of training data or as a function of like model size. While here it's for grokking, it's literally as you train the network for longer and longer on the exact same set of data, you see this sort of weird generalization behavior. I guess the other thing I wanted to say was people often mistakenly say that grokking is after, you know, you achieve perfect train loss, but that's not <laughs> actually a thing you can actually achieve in practice, right? Because train loss is log loss. You can always just drive your probabilities up a tiny, tiny, tiny amount, and then it's going to be better. If we look here, we see that train loss goes from about three times 10 to the minus seven to maybe one times 10 to the minus seven. And this is kind of ridiculous. Right. Um, but for context, the way to think about loss is that the probability given to the correct number is e to the power of minus log loss ish. And so this is saying that the correct probability is e to minus three times 10 to the minus seven with the 10 to the minus 7 inside the exponents, which is ridiculously close to 1. So the model goes from ridiculously good, because this is such a stupid toy problem that models can actually get that good, to even more ridiculously good. Though I will say that you can achieve zero log loss if you exploit precision errors in your floating point numbers properly. Everything is zero log loss if you use float 8. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Eight rounds everything to the nearest, like, I don't know, 10%. And so if your loss is low enough, you just round to zero. It's great. So grokking is this weird mystery where this is just not what we expect to happen with networks. Two things that I want to emphasize about grokking, since I think this is often a thing people misunderstand, is that one, grokking is a thing that requires you to have some kind of regularization, some kind of thing you're doing to the model to make it simpler. In our case, we mostly focus on weights decay, which is just this thing where you tell the model if you make your total parameter norm smaller, we also say you have better performance. If you remove this, it just doesn't grok. Though 
I've heard some Anak data that people manage to get things to grok with just stochastic gradient descent and no regularization explicitly. That seems very possible. Yeah. The second thing worth saying is that grokking is a kind of weird intermediate phase you get where you have exactly enough training data so that the model slightly prefers to generalize than memorize. And generally, I found that to get models to look really dramatically grokky like this, you needed to fiddle with the hyperparameters a fair bit, even more so in some of the other settings I got grokking to happen. Notably, the interesting one is you have to fiddle with the atom hyperparameters sometimes, which is kind of interesting. So this is um, grokking for different fractions of data. One cute thing is that if you look at the loss curve, there's this kind of uh, kink here where it changes gradient. And one of the things that seems to somewhat determine where this happens and partially determine where this happens is the uh, second moment in Adam, where Adam like accumulates the sum of the average squared gradients with some memory over past gradients and then divides by this. Normally, this is just a kind of, eh, it doesn't really matter how big your gradients are. But with grokking, you're going from really big loss, like five, to tiny loss, like 10 to the minus four. And the gradients also drop sharply when you do this. And so if you're dividing by something with memory from gradients back here, then everything's minuscule. Indeed, what we see in follow-up work, right, that when you use beta, when you use like two close to one, you don't actually get grokking until much, much later along the thing. It is kind of interesting, though, that, that the default atom parameter is 0 0.999. So like, you know, it's really, really close to one. When in practice, if you like try to estimate what the appropriate atom parameter is for realistic data set or realistic number of training steps, it looks something more like 0 0.95 or 0 0.98. And in fact, like things in that range are what people use to train their large language models. I mean, the PyTorch defaults are not actually that good. Does the original Adam paper recommend 0.999? Yeah, but that's because they tried it on like a toy regression problem. And they're like, <laughs> on this toy regression problem, it works great. 0 0.9, 0 0.999, that's the best parameters. But in practice, like the thing is incredibly overtrained. The problem is much simpler than the problems you actually encounter in practice. While like, you know, the number of gradient steps taken by when over the course of say GPT-3 training, there might only be a million gradient steps or like, you know, 100,000 gradient steps even. Um, and at that point, it's just, you don't want to have such a large beta to the point where like, you know, you're, you're over updating on the initial like big gradients and like not updating enough on the later gradients. Zooming out a bit of the weeds, just to briefly summarize what Adam is for the people who don't spend all day staring at weird ML things. Adam is a variant of stochastic gradient descent, this thing where you just update your parameters based on what makes them a bit better at the task. And the way Adam works is that you have this kind of moving average of your gradients so that you have less noise and you kind of move more smoothly. Then you also have a moving average of the squared gradients and you divide by this to kind of normalize stuff. And this is kind of weird and kind of a pain. And the way to think about the betas we're referring to is they determine how long the memory is. So a beta of 0.999, which is 1 minus 1 over 1,000, basically means you remember about 1,000 steps back. Beta of 0.98, which is what we used here, means you remember about 50 steps back, because 1 minus 1 over 50. And so digression by Adam aside, if you vary the amount of data, the kind of dramaticness of your grokking changes a bunch. Note that the, so the top three graphs here are 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, where we see no grokking, no grokking, pretty dramatic grokking. And then on the bottom graphs, we change the x-axis width from 20,000 to 5,000 steps. And things just are way less dramatic and way less cool. So it is, it is interesting that all the training curves look very similar. So like the kinks at 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, they all occur at similar positions. And in fact, they all seem to reach around like 3 times 10 to the minus 7 loss at around 1,400 steps. Weird. It is very weird. Also, this is true for, um, it's also true that for every single seed of the data fraction 0 0.3 runs, it also reaches around that point at 1400 steps. It just seems to be a fact about the problem we're studying or, and so forth. Though I guess we should talk about the problem we're studying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So zooming out of what the hell is grokking, the philosophy behind this work 
is, so this is a paper about mechanistic interpretability, which is this subfield of interpretability where our goal is try to reverse engineer what algorithms a model has learned. We take a model that's been trained to do a task. We know that it is good at the task, but it's all we know is that its parameters are being repeatedly shifted a bit to be better at the task. We have no idea how it does what it does. And the goal of mechanistic interpretability is saying, okay, we're going to make the bold hypothesis. These models actually learn some meaningful interpretable algorithm. The kind of thing that in theory we could have coded ourselves, even if we have no idea how to code the kind of weird shit that ChatGPT can do, like write poetry or explain jokes. And then use a bunch of complex ad hoc, though ideally less ad hoc techniques to reverse engineer what actual algorithm has been learned. The seed of this work is, I was like, okay, grokking is this really weird mystery. I have no idea why it happens, but also it's in two layer networks, two layer networks, not that hard. This is exactly the kind of thing mechanistic interpretability should be able to do. If the bold claims the field is making that we can actually understand models is true, then actually understand what on earth is going on just should be the right way to demystify what's going on. I see this work as kind of a proof of concept that a promising way to take the weird ass mysteries in deep learning and figure out what's going on is to take a model that exhibits these, reverse engineer that model, and use this to actually look inside and see what's going on. Hopefully, by the end of this walkthrough, you'll agree that grokking feels a lot less mysterious. Concretely, what we did is we trained a one-layer transformer to do modular addition. Addition mod 113, so just add two numbers. If they're bigger than 113, take the remainder when dividing by 113, and try to reverse engineer what is going on. It turns out that it learned this wild trig-based algorithm that we have in this beautiful diagram Lawrence made for us. So it turns out that what the model has done is it said, screw thinking about this in terms of addition. Addition is weird. I don't want to think through things like adding the unit digit, carrying the one, crap like that. The morally correct way to think about modular addition is as rotations around the unit circle where the number a is like rotates by the angle a, a divided by 113, the way around the circle. The way to think about b is b over 113, way around the circle. The way to think about adding them is to compose the two rotations to get a plus b over 113 ways around the circle. This instantly gets you the mod part, because if you wrap around, like wrap around a full way around the circle, it doesn't matter. And then it learns to figure out what the right answer is in this weird ad hoc way. So the way the output of a transformer works is it's outputting 113 different numbers called logits. We feed this through a softmax to get a probability distribution over the possible outputs. And the model for the seeth output logit the model learns to rotate backwards by C. It learns to then look at how far it was along the x-axis and then was like, okay, if I go back by exactly A plus B mod N, I end up here. This is the biggest thing along the x-axis. And so when I feed them through the softmax, I can just get the correct C. That is what this model is doing. And it's like, what? Anything you want to add for high level what the model is doing, Lawrence? No, that seems broadly correct. Though I will say that the network doesn't just do it by like two pi times, you know, A over 113. It does it over like many multiples of that for reasons we'll discuss later. Yes, the algorithm I outlined, it's kind of easiest to think of in terms of A is A over 113 ways around the circle, B is B over 113. But it works equally well for like A times 20 over 113 ways around the circle. Whereas it's wrapping round a bunch, because the same argument of if you wrap round an integer number of times, it all cancels out, so holds. Right. We'll dig more into why we know this is what the model learns and trying to motivate why this is a reasonable thing for the model to learn. But the thing I wanted to start at the moment is just, we just actually fully reverse engineered a network. We basically understand what all of the parameters are doing, and it's doing a pretty 
clean, interpretable, albeit weird and galaxy-brained thing. By finding this algorithm, we took this weird mystery of grokking and mostly managed to figure out what was going on. Concretely, what we did is we came up with these progress measures. These progress measures are basically something designed to track how much the model is memorizing versus generalizing. So one of the things which is kind of thorny about grokking is that the model has these two solutions, memorizing and generalizing, that both look the same on the training data. They're both just things that give you the right answer, and both give you an incredibly correct answer of 3 times 10 to the minus 7, 1 times 10 to the minus 7, which again are insane figures that you only get in ridiculous problems like grokking. The thing which is thorny and messy about this is that because generalization and memorization look the same on the training data, it's pretty hard to disentangle them. I mean, you can look at things like how well the model does on the test loss, but the whole point of grokking is that's a, that seems weird and sharp. But because we actually understand what the model is doing, we can significantly dissolve our confusions here by instead looking at kind of trying to track progress between how much the internals represent the memorizing solution versus the generalizing solution. We'll discuss these more later, but we came up with this thing called excluded loss, which measures how much the model's ability to do well on the training data is from pure memorization. It's initially entirely memorization, but then during this plateau, it diverges. These three lines distinguish uh, what's going on into these three phases of training. Memorization, where it just memorizes the training data. Circuit formation, where it's transitioning from memorizing to generalizing, holding train performance fixed, which is like not even a thing I knew models could do. Yeah, I can plateau at that for some reason. And then uh, excluded loss diverges, which shows that the ability to do well on train is going from mostly memorized to basically entirely generalized. And then there's this cleanup phase, which is best illustrated by this restricted loss metric. So the idea behind cleanup is that the model, in order to perform well on the unseen test data, it needs to both have a mature generalizing circuit, and it needs to not have a memorizing circuit. Because the memorizing circuit is really good on training data, but really, really bad on the unseen data. Like when it's purely memorizing, it's much, much worse than random. So when it's doing half memorizing, half generalizing, it's still terrible. And restricted loss, we just delete the memorizing circuit. We delete everything apart from the generalizing circuit and look at performance from there. And we see that it just smoothly gets better. And at the point when the test loss is just crossing about as good as random, it's like perfect. So it's not like a perfectly smooth thing. The generalizing performance definitely does still crash around the time grokking happens. But the fact that there's this lag tells us that grokking is because of cleanup. It's not purely because the model is, I don't know, wandering randomly around the loss landscape until it stumbles around the right solution. It's making steady progress there. In particular, like the smoothness of both the excluded loss and the restricted loss suggests that this is the case. Or if we look at the other metrics, like everything yes. is quite smooth. There seems to be this like continuous change over time as opposed to sort of, you know, a discrete jump. Yeah, this whole idea of progress measures is one of the underlying motivations and hopefully contributions to this work, where there's this broader weird phenomena of emergence, where models go from terrible at some task, like, I uh, know, adding numbers, but then as you make them bigger or train them longer, they seem to kind of suddenly go from can't add numbers to can totally add numbers in the case of GPT-3, where GPT-3 can somehow add three-digit numbers reasonably well, while smaller versions just completely can't. Chain of thought prompting, where you tell it to think step by step and it magically becomes better, just only really works on big models and doesn't work on smaller models. The hope behind progress measures is that models are actually making smoother and more continuous progress, but it doesn't really show up until it crosses a certain threshold. But that if you could dig into what's going on, you might be able to find some smoother things to let us predict this and maybe forecast this. And this is intended to be a kind of very, very janky proof of concept for if you can reverse engineer the thing 
and have a mechanistic story of what's going on, you might be able to come up with progress measures that really drill into exactly what the capability is. I think progress measures, or in general, the science of deep learning style approaches are what I'm more bullish on in terms of this sort of hands-on ad hoc interpretability. Uh, because let's be real, the sort of thing we did here, we cannot <laughs> scale it by hand to GPT-3. I mean, we can, we scale to GPT-2 small and it starts exploding. So like, insofar as this sort of hands-on reverse engineering mechanistic interpretability has any sort of like impact on our understanding of large models, it has to be through something like understanding training dynamics or understanding like how networks behave in general, like a science of deep learning question, as opposed to like, you know, does GPT-3 implement modular addition using the same circuit as this two-layer model or this one-layer model. I don't want to push back on that a bit. I think that seems pretty plausible to me that even if we can't fully reverse engineer GPT-3, we could get like good enough finding specific local questions we want to ask, like, is this model thinking deceptive thoughts or does it have goals internally represented? And like, can we pick what those are? Am I able to get like some traction? Sorry, I, I mean, I'm not saying like interpretability is not possible. I'm or mechanistic interpretability in general is not possible. I'm just saying this sort of approach where we have humans stare really, really hard at the model. We need something a little beyond just, you know, examining every single attention head or looking at all the saliency maps or something to get something complicated like is the model thinking deceptive thoughts. Seems pretty reasonable. Yeah, okay, cool. I will totally defend staring at the weights might just work, goddammit. Oh man, there's so many weights though. <laughs> Maybe this is a good point to transition into uh, reasons this work is kind of bullshit, which is the section that I wish all papers had, but sadly conference reviewers don't always appreciate it. You could sneak it in, sneak it in into the into the appendix at the end. Yeah, because we're going to actually read the appendix. So you can just include like a list of reasons why this work is kind of bullshit, and you should like not take it seriously. Okay, I, I hope I hope our reviewers are not reading this because we did sneak it into the appendix. My speculation about whether or not mechanistic interpretability is useful uh, is Appendix F. What? I do not remember that. Where is Appendix I F? You're involved at this point. Yes, part of the backstory of <laughs> this paper is that I hate writing papers, and Lawrence is very good at writing papers. And he kindly agreed to take a lot of this off my hands, which included, apparently, sneaking in appendices <laughs> about how this work is doomed. So... One of the reasons why I think this work is like somewhat BS, or at least less useful than it appears at first glance, is like, as Lawrence is saying, we interpreted this one layer model trained on this really, really nice algorithmic task where there was like a single clean circuit that we could reverse engineer. We understood all of the relevant features that could go into this. The techniques we used were ridiculously weird ad hoc things based on the fact that we could understand the trig-based algorithm, the fact that we can do Fourier transforms to it, to think about it in terms of trig stuff. I don't want to oversell the degree to which this was like completely ad hoc. We've got a forthcoming paper led by Bilal Chuktai, where we show that you can generalize this algorithm to arbitrary group composition via some bullshit maths called representation theory, where rather than thinking about geometric transformations of the unit circle, it thinks about geometric transformations of the four-dimensional tetrahedron and weird-ass stuff like that. But it definitely is like very specific to this weird toy model on this nice algorithmic task of group composition. And this is very much doing interpretability under the streetlight of the stuff that's easiest to look at. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say like of the limitations mentioned, I think the two most critical ones are one, that there's like a single model of a small circuit. Right, like in practice, if you look at real realistic circuits, even in GPT-2 small, they often like involve seven layers and 32 attention heads or something. While here, our circuit only has a single MOP layer and, a, and four attention heads because that's all the network has. So that's limitation one. I think the other limitation is the thing you mentioned about how like the space of all features is quite limited, right? So even in like MNIST, what you when you actually do this sort of like visualization of importance of features, you see there's a massive tail of like slightly less important, slightly less important features. And dealing with that is just like kind of a hard problem. Well, in our case, there's like, you know, 56 or 113 reasonable features, and we could just check all of them. When you're referring to the long tail, you're referring to the like anthropic memorization double descent thing at the end? Yeah, or like extensions of that work. In general, there's a high question of like, 
this is more discussed in the next paper. So maybe we'll leave it for that. <laughs> but there is fundamentally a question of like, you know, how many things are there in the world? How many features are in the world that are actually important? Because you might think that if there's only like, you know, a finite number of features that are like very, very important and the rest are like not at all important, that you might just be able to reverse engineer networks by looking at these features. But in practice, it seems like even for MNIST, they're just like, you know, subtler and subtler curves as you go along that are helpful for recognizing particular types of sevens or particular types of eights. And so it's not as clean as you would have hoped in practice. A extreme example of this is the model just memorizes each thousand word string you give it. Yes, in the limit of infinite capacity, you could just memorize everything. There's also just when the model is doing many tasks, it starts doing much weirder things. So fundamentally, our model is over-parameterized in the sense that it has more parameters than it actually needs to learn this task. Right. MLP with a single hidden layer can do it. If you make the residual stream with 32 rather than 128, as we have here, it can do it. This means that the model is happy to learn kind of clean, sparse things that are laid out nicely with minimal interference, where we'll see later that the neurons just cluster into different bits of the algorithm, while in real models, you get weird things like superposition, where the model has more features it wants to learn than neurons, and these just get compressed into space in this really weird way. You can go check out my walkthrough on the toy models of superposition paper, if you want more about how weird and annoying superposition. I do think fundamentally it's a question of how many features are actually relevant. Like in practice, especially with text-based models, right? We have things like Zip's Law or something like that, which tell us, you know, the importance of features is log log is a straight line on the log log plot, which just means, yep, there's always going to be more features that are like, you know, exponentially less important, but only exponentially as opposed to doubly less expo double exponentially less important. For example, knowing who Neil Nanza is or the contents of this paper is pretty damn neat. But not so niche that it's not useful to know if you have infinite capacity. I will push back a bit on what you're saying, in that I think that even if there's in practice an infinite tale of features you could learn, the question of what in practice do models learn is like an open question. Oh, sorry, it's not I'm not saying it's because of like infinite tale of features. I'm, I make a specific claim about the thickness of the tail, that like the importance mm. of features declines like only exponentially instead of doubly exponentially, or at least like people claim this is the case. And this is why like models have an incentive to jam in more features than you would think. While like, on the other hand, if like feature importance like drops off a cliff at a certain point, presumably the model does not need to learn the other features. Like models are trading off interference with the important features with being able to jam in more features. And this is just an empirical trade-off where it depends on the structure of the data. And you're saying, it seems to be a fact about the world that the trade-off incentivizes jam in more features back. Yep, and in particular, we see the same sort of distribution of importance of features across both text-based and image-based uh, features. Off-topic, I just like... These walkthroughs are all about random off-topic tangents. I assume this is why people watch this. While we're attacking our own paper, uh, two other things I think are worth saying. I think a bunch of people see this, and they're like, oh my god, we might understand generalization. And like, grokking is not relevant to real models. Grokking is this weird-ass toy thing you get when you have a problem where you can memorize data to a ridiculous degree, because you can see the entire universe, and you train on the same data again and again, like tens of thousands of times. Meanwhile, GPT-3 is trained on 300 billion tokens of text, and it sees every token once. There was this interesting paper from Danny Hernandez and Tropic that was like, turns out there's a scaling law in how fast models memorize, and big models can memorize in about three uh, instances, while well, smaller models need many. It's like, maybe this matters somewhat, but I just think it's such a weird thing that it's most relevant to just underlying principles of deep learning than it is anything that's like concretely modeling real models. And also the thing about over-parameterization, right? Grokking is the thing you see in the over-parameterized and over-trained regime. While like, in practice, models are, you know, you don't want to over-train your models, and you also don't want to over-parameterize. Presumably your models are not actually over-parameterized because there's so many things to know about the real world. I mean, if they were over-parameterized, uh, just make them bigger would not be an effective strategy. Right, exactly, yeah. The final critique I want to make is that I think that the progress measures we have here are cute and satisfying and like a decent proof of concept that understanding things can be useful. But fundamentally, these aren't fully predictive. 
We needed to have a trained model to reverse engineer, though now we understand the algorithm, we can like generalize a bit, but this is, you know, I'd rather not have to train a homicidal deceptive AGI in order to be able to detect the homicidal neuron. We can't forecast precisely when it will drop from these progress measures. We can look at progress and see that it is making progress. And I think this is a meaningful advance on what on earth is going on. But I do not think this is solved. Or you can see like the places where these curves bend, for example, that we can't predict ahead of time when it's going to bend. The restricted loss crosses 0 0.01 around the time cleanup happens. Is this a magic threshold we could have predicted in advance? Probably not. I did some poking around. I think you might be able to extrapolate out from like here when it will grok, but I didn't manage to get a perfectly extrapolated with zero future data. So I did manage to get the amount of future data down pretty low. The alternative one you might think is um, the place at which excluded loss crosses like random performance. So like at a certain point, excluded loss just becomes approximately random performance or slightly worse than, you know, random performance because there's noise. And it, it's conceivable that that might be a threshold. Though, again, we have not actually explored that very well in the paper. And to be clear, you both want a threshold, but you also want the ability to extrapolate the rate at which it's getting to the threshold. Yeah, we don't, we don't have that or the threshold. And I guess staring at excluded loss, it's surprisingly linear on the log scale y-axis, a linear scale x-axis. But like, I don't know, it's kind of nonsense. Oh yeah, one point I should make while I'm criticizing graphs is that it's just so easy to massage how fancy grokking does and does not look when oh god you change oh god yes the, like log or linear scale on your axis. One thing which I am inordinately proud of having made is uh, so this is a very janky website where you can play around with our figures progress measures dash grokking .io, and I have these buttons where you can toggle like how log your axes are. And sure looks a lot less impressive when you've got a linear scale y-axis. Even if you zoom in so it's kind of it's vertical. I guess they are basically vertical. <laughs> and then if you log your x-axis, things look like so much more impressive. Can I pan? Yeah, I can pan. Yeah, you can pan. Yeah. So sharp. Does it hold even more so for accuracy? Oh man, it just goes straight up. Yeah, and uh, let, let's do the same to these ones, so... Oh my god, it's so dramatic. Restricted loss is basically the same as test loss. It's beautiful. Wow, restricted loss is so smooth and linear. And, I don't know, a thing that I think is worth paying attention to when you're reading a paper is what will these graphs look like if you uh, change the scale on your axes? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, this does matter for many papers, right? So like, for example, in the anthropic induction head paper, uh, their, their x-axis is logged. And so they get this dramatic like induction bump. But when you actually like oh. look at it, it is still like somewhat dramatic, but it isn't like as clean as it is if you log the x-axis. So I think for the real models they use, they had a log scale. For the toy models, they had a linear scale. Yep. The toy models are very clean. I agree with that. It's the, the real <laughs> models that like, you know, you needed to massage the thing a little to make it nicer. Real models are just rough to work with. So like, I, I totally get it. Yes, this was a very fun, di this paper was a very fun diversion from my like actual job of interpret language models. <laughs> it's so much easier, man. Yeah, it is so much easier. I agree. And yeah, the final high level thing I want to get into before we jump into, you know, the actual paper is why does grokking happen? Like what? What is going on? I don't claim that this paper fully explains the story, but to me, there's kind of three key elements you need. You need the kind of problem that exhibits phase transitions. That is the kind of problem where there's some feature of it such that models will tend to be bad for a while and then suddenly become good rather than smoothly become good. One obvious hypothesis of why this happens is because of um, when your algorithm requires multiple components to work in concert. Yeah, like a really dumb example of this would be training numbers A and B that multiply to one. If you initialize A and B to be like 0 0.001 each and then do gradient descent, derivative of A is like B, which is 0 0.001. Derivative of B is A, which is tiny. So each moves a teensy, teensy bit at a time. 
And then, but as they get bigger, they're like half, the gradients are half, 200x bigger, it'll move 200x faster, etc. And I think in that particular case, Adam can solve it because Adam does stupid normalization. Yeah, of course. But in, in practice, it's not as easy as just like A times B, right? It's like there's a complicated component you have to learn here and a complicated component you have to learn here. Well, like, I don't know, if we go and stare at our actual algorithm, the model doesn't, like, there's no point in learning that the inputs are rotations around the circle if you can't compose them and if you can't convert them to the outputs. Exactly, exactly, yep. Yeah, so a concrete example of this is uh, the case of induction heads, which are this circuit we found in toy language models where the model looks for repeated text and then continues it. Like, maybe one day it's reading a newspaper article about this glorious paper where it sees Lawrence, and it's like, what comes after Lawrence? Surely it's not Chan. But Lawrence Chan appeared in the po- in, earlier in the article, so Chan probably does come next. Though, one day Chan will obviously be the natural next word after Lawrence, I'm sure. We'll see what happens, yeah. So I trained to this toy model where I just gave it random numbers and then picked some subset of the random numbers, copied it somewhere else random in the sequence, and told it to predict the copied bit, such that it wanted to form induction heads. And then when you give it infinite data, it learns this phase transition. So there's like some inherent structure of the problem. We also observe phase transitions on like actual language data, and there's a couple of other examples of this. Like there's a phase transition in how alpha zero learns chess knowledge, for example. And so I think grokking happens when you've got a phase transition, where my inter- intuitive understanding of a phase transition is there's something difficult to learn about the solution, probably because it requires bits to line up in the way Lawrence was saying, then the memorized solution does not require things to line up in the same way. You can just start anywhere and just kind of smush things to conform to the memorized data. So it's easier to get to the memorization, but then you've got regularization in this case, weight decay, that favor a simpler solution. Grokking happens in a case where the model slightly prefers the general solution over the memorized solution, such that it gets the memorized solution first because it's easier, but then, and in particular, when you need bits to line up to get the generalizing solution, there's like a pretty weak incentive to learn it early on, but there's a really strong incentive to learn it here because if the other bits are mostly in place, then... Once you have the, like, you know the induction-like head at the second layer. Once you have the like the head that like moves things one position to the right on the first layer, it becomes there's a much stronger incentive to just form the induction circuit as opposed yeah, exactly. to you know wandering around. And then the third component is limited data, where one of the key differences between memorizing and generalizing as solutions is that memorizing scales in complexity with the number of data points, generalizing doesn't. Kind of if you're memorizing single data points, this is just obviously easier than generalizing. If you're memorizing every single data point in existence, this is probably harder than generalizing. And so something, something, each intermediate value theorem, there should be a crossover point where it like slightly prefers. And what I basically found is that even on weird tasks, like uh, this kind of toy induction heads thing, where it was given sequences of like 100 tokens, there were like 100 values, there was 100 to the 100 possible inputs at 512 data points, you, should get, you could get it to grok. Note that we're cheating because you've got a linear scale on the y-axis, and it looks weird. Way more dramatic looking. It's so much more dramatic looking in this case. Uh, yeah. But like, graph fiddling is an important part of like true research salesmanship. And then it turns out that if you just like binary search on the amount of data, you could find the point where it will grok. But if you're too high, it will generalize immediately. If you're too low, it will memorize. So to recap the story of grokking, there is some property of the problem such that it's hard to learn the true solution and it requires bits to line up. And this is just a property of the problem, not an uh, inherent property of like the grokking setup and memorization, then generalization. You give it regularization, so it prefers to generalize, and you give it exactly enough data that it m- only marginally prefers to generalize because generalizing is slightly simpler. And then you give it exactly enough data that it marginally prefers to do this. But memorization is easier, so it first memorizes. But then once it's memorized, you get this kind of balancing point where it um, could improve performance by just like doubling all of the output logits. And you've got perfect accuracy. Doubling all your logits is just becoming more confident, so becoming even better. But that's complicated. 
So this balances at a certain point. And then eventually, the desire to be simpler and the desire to perform better both align behind learn to generalize. So it slowly creeps towards that as it forms the circuit. And then um, once it's formed the circuit, it can equilibrate at a new point with a, because the solution is simpler, it can have slightly bigger logics. And we see this in this drop. And I think this is worth highlighting because it's not that memorizing is inherently more complex than generalizing. It's that holding weight norm fixed or holding performance fixed, memorizing is more complex than generalizing. Or at least for the problems we're studying. Yes. And one of the pet hypotheses I have that was actually going on is there's some kind of wild lottery ticket style setup going on. This is going into wild speculation. So Lawrence should event will eventually cut me off. But uh, the lottery ticket hypothesis is this hypothesis that uh, models don't kind of learn, they don't like create the eventual solutions they come up with. They've just got so many random weights at the start that there's some subset of weights that's kind of pretty close to the effective solution. And the model slowly learns to amplify that and suppress the others. And my story of grokking and phase transitions is the model starts with a kind of basic framework of kind of got the moving stuff to the right bit of the induction, kind of got the induction head that looks at like that, but it's got loads of other crap. But the loads of other crap slowly cancels out and suppress the actually useful bit reinforces each other, and it just slowly gets to a point where it's doing something sensible. And there's this good post by Adam German and Buck Schleigerus called S-shaped curves um, that we can put in the description, which tries to dig more into this on a theoretical level. We could also put in the the Xander Davies and like Laurel Lekongsko post on um, grokking as well, right? There was a lot of concurrent work around the time that this was this work was done that it relates to sort of grokking or double descent or the sort of phase transition stuff for whatever reason. Yes, there was this particularly fun paper called Omnigrok where they found that if you take a task like Eminus and then you just scale all the weights by like 10x, that somehow this starts grokking. That was just a wild result. It just seems like for whatever reason, the memorization circuits require really, really big weights for whatever reason. And it's like, I'm not sure why, but it does seem to be a fact that these memorization circuits just require very, very large weight norms. Yeah. I mean, it's like kind of intuitive to me. Like uh, when I picture memorization, I'm picturing kind of like a, got a bunch of data points arranged in a nice curve and the model learns this like weird squiggly crap that goes through all of them. And it has like loads of ad hoc turns and crap. And like, that just seems like it should obviously have higher weight. Actual paper time? Yeah. I think we have appropriately covered high level things we want people to take away from the paper. Now we're going to jump more into the weeds and actually read through it with a big focus on the actual algorithm, what's going on and how we know. Also, hopefully we'll get to why the paper is good and cool. Ah, we talked about why it was good and cool in the first five minutes and then spent half an hour explaining why it was terrible. This is what all paper walkthroughs should be about, Lawrence. Oh, man. 